Those two key facts is that this was written to people who were genuine Christians, first fact. Second fact, people who were not living in the way that Christians ought to live. They were living from the eye. I, I remember, just before we move on, I remember when I was a very young Christian, um, all our meetings, other than the church meetings, used to take place in the, the rectory, which was kind of like the parish house, this is where the, the rector or the vicar lived. Um, and I remember that he had a big study and a big fireplace. And on the fireplace was a, a prayer card from a group called, uh, what well, was the Rwanda Rundi Mission. There was a man named Joe Church, and they had a teaching that a man named Brian Roy Hessian uh, later kind of adopted and, and kind of made uh, wider, more widely known. Um, and on, on the card, on the, the, the mantel shelf, he had this card, and it, it, was, it was a quotation from Galatians 2 and 20, where Paul again uses this emphatic I, and he says, uh, the life that I now love, yet no longer I. And he makes this, but I, I don't live this life, but Christ lives in me, he says. And in this text that they got, it had written out, um, no longer I, but Christ. And what they'd done is, in Rwanda Rundi, um, the ruling tribe over many centuries had been the Watutsi. And if you can remember, not too distant ago, the Watutsi are very tall, noble kind of looking people, and they were almost the hereditary rulers. And the, the Hatu, I think, were the kind of the, the, the smaller uh, in stature anyway. Um, and when this, there was a revival that moved among them for many years, and, and, the, and the Watutsi always used to say that they knew when, when they were walking in the power of the revival, because they felt no pride or superiority towards the Hatu. And as soon as they began to become complacent, and uh, life <coughs> began to lose its fire, or it began to lose its edge, this kind of sense of haughtiness and pride of place would begin to raise its head again. And what they'd done in this thing was, when it said, not I, but Christ, in the capital I, there was a Watutsi warrior standing very kind of proud and erect, and curled right up with his face on the ground into the sea of Christ was another Watutsi. Not I, but Christ. Now, not I, but Christ is the working dynamic of Christianity. It's the working dynamic of Christianity. Not only Christ, but not I. A definite choice not to go my own way. A definite choice not to make my own uh, preferences, the, the, the pattern by which my life is directed. But to deny myself and to say yes to the will of Christ. So not I, but Christ. Okay, I want to talk now in the second part about two sources or two kinds of wisdom. I don't know whether you remember because it's over a month ago now, but when we talked in the first sessions, I talked about the city of Corinth and told you that it was actually a very sophisticated city. It was a city where there, was, there were many, many intelligent people. It was famous for its philosophers and all kinds of things. It was famous, in other words, for its wisdom. But the trouble is that it was the wrong kind of wisdom. It was the wisdom of human intellect. It was the wisdom of man's pride in thinking that he can solve this problem. Whatever this thing is, we can cure it. I always go back to my kind of quote about the six million dollar man at this point. If you remember, those of you who are old enough to remember the six million dollar man, he was a, an, air, uh, an air pilot, a uh, test pilot, who was almost killed and then they said, uh, we, can, we have the technology, we can rebuild it. And they made this kind of robotic character. Um, but it's that, it's that kind of pride, we can do it. We, we've got the resources, we can rebuild it. We, we can solve it. And this pride in human intellect, and this pride in the human ability to get to the bottom of all problems and to solve everything, was endemic in Corinth. It was, it, was, it was rife with it. Actually, it was rife through all the Greek empire, all the Greek world, but particularly in Corinth. And Paul is now going to write about different kinds of wisdom and which kind of wisdom we are going to choose. 
Um, and this is what he has to say. In, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. And this is one of those places where it is helpful to use the New King James Version. Because I'll read what it says here in my version. I've got it in front of me. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now if you're using an old King James Version, you'll have the word world twice. And one of the problems with the Old King James Version is that there are three different words in the, in the original Greek language which are all translated in the King James Version by the one word world. And actually they have a different kind of a feel to them. And that's why here it's actually split them up. Where is the disputer of this age? One of these words, aeon, really means a kind of an era, an epoch, a period of time. And what Paul is saying here is he's, he's, he's throwing out this challenge. It's one of these many questions that Paul asks to engage our thinking. And he says, well, where is the disputer of this age? There's a lot of contrast in the New Testament between this age and the age that is to come. In the letter to the Hebrews, for example, it describes genuine Christians of people who have begun to partake of the powers of the world to come. It's Aeon, it's the age to come. So there is an age to come and there's this age. And regenerate men and women are people who have already begun to taste and enjoy and partake of the powers of a coming era. We're, we're ahead of schedule. And there is a regeneration coming where the, all things will pass away and all things will become new when there will be a new heaven and a new earth and the old will have passed away at the present time that hasn't taken place we are ahead we're at the front of the crowd if we're born again because in us already the work of regeneration has made it start um, and in us all things have passed away and all things have become new so that's one of the words it's Aeon and the other is this word world which really means sort of the system, it's, um, this is the word cosmos, and it's actually the word we get cosmetic from. It has to do with kind of order and pattern and shape. So what Paul is talking about is the fact that there is a way of thinking which really is, it, it's from this era. It's from, not the era of grace, it's from this era, and this era has someone ruling over it. He, he refers to it in Ephesians as the prince of the power of the air. Uh, this, this, um, and John's letter, if you remember, he says that uh, the, w the wicked one doesn't touch us, although the whole world is in his embrace. So there's a sense in which the world, its ways of thinking, its order, its structure, its patterns, its organization, its ability to exist without God, its independence of God, it actually made possible because there is another kind of a wisdom that's kind of flowing into it. And it's a, win a wisdom that is diametrically opposed, absolutely opposite um, to the kind of wisdom that Paul wants to talk about here. So what does he say? Um, well, he's talking about this wisdom which is, if, if the world is, when people talk about the world, sometimes... This used to happen more, perhaps, maybe 50 years ago amongst Christians. When they said the world, they meant pictures or makeup or beer or cigarettes or something like that. Um, I don't know what you think of now when you say the world. Uh, but the world, you can't, you can't make that straightforward equation that the world is the cinema or the world is the dance hall. Actually, the world, it's an atmosphere, it's a mindset. And what is at the centre of it is independence of God. I think I've said this to you before, but many, many years ago now, the Duke of Edinburgh was speaking at a meeting of farmers, and he was quite amusing, and he was saying different things that appealed to them. And he was referring to the fact that they were doing some experiments, I think, with silver nitrate to seed clouds to see if they could make it rain. And he, he said, um, you know, we've got these kind of super seeds, and we've got these fertilizers, and we've got this, and now we can even change the weather. We don't need God anymore. Now, that's, that, the essence of that, I'm not, I'm not criticizing him, because other people would feel the same, even if they didn't say it. 
What I'm saying is that that essence is we, that we don't need God anymore, that we can go it alone in our independence, is the essence of the world mindset. Mm. It's, it's there. Of course, it goes right back to Genesis chapter 3. It goes right back to the very beginning when the temptation was that if man was only willing to break free from God and break this single prohibition that God had put in place, this is what Satan said to Eve, God knows you won't die. You will actually become like God, knowing good and evil. You will become in yourself the judge uh, and the jury. Um, you, you don't need any external absolute standard of any kind. You yourself will be able to determine what's good and evil. You can be God yourself. And you know that's actually the kind of world we live in. Well, people are, some people complain about falling standards and, and they say morality isn't the same. What, what they're really saying is that at different times you see this in different ways, but the world is a system which has found a way of working without dependence upon God. And it's pride. Pride. Years ago, there used to be in the meetings that we had at Warsaw in Poland. There used to be there were two grandmasters, chess grandmasters, who came to the meetings. Now, if you played chess at all, these are people with three brains each. Um, <coughs> these, these are people of amazing intellect and ability, um, of a particular kind, anyway. And I can remember talking to one of them one day, and I said, "Well, what is the appeal?" you know, of chess at the level that you play at. And he said, pride. Mm. He said, he said, what you're trying to do is you're trying to wrestle that man's brain down until he surrenders. That's what you're trying to do. It's interesting, because that that's really what the real thrust of it was. It's this competitiveness. Mm. Um, okay, so it's this. And Corinth was famous for this kind of wisdom. In fact, the Greek word for wisdom is sophos or sophia, which is the word we get sophisticated from. And when we say sophisticated, we mean, well, you know, a person who is fairly kind of secure in life and they can, they're not dependent on people, they can make their own ways, they think in a certain way, they've got their own style. They're confident in the fact that they can survive and more than survive in this world. Okay. Now Paul begins to speak of another wisdom and this is what you'll see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. He says, For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And then he illustrates this by talking about two groups of people, the Jews and the Greeks. And he says, well, the Jews always wanted a power sign. That's what they wanted. <coughs> Remember the gospel? They were always wanting a sign. Mm. And the Lord Jesus said, a wicked and evil generation seek after a sign and no sign will be given them. They wanted an absolute proof in, time, in terms of dynamic and power that they could see. Now, the Greek instinct was actually to want a different kind of a proof. <coughs> Not a physical proof, but a mental proof. Something which was absolutely watertight in its logical presentation, so that you couldn't possibly come <coughs> to any other conclusion other than this one. And they were brilliant at it, they really were. And what Paul is saying is really, is that what God has done in Christ, it's almost as though God has gone out of his way to kind of cause as big a stumbling block as possible to both these mindsets. Uh, the one who demands that God will show his power and his muscle, show himself mighty on behalf of those, and Paul speaks here in 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians about the cross, and he describes it as God's weakness. It says that Christ was crucified through weakness. And he, here he describes it as foolishness. And of course he's not sort of saying in absolute terms it's foolish. What he's just simply said, saying is that if you, if you view this through... Um, if you view this through the grid of natural wisdom, this is crazy. This is absolute folly. Why would God do this? Why would a God who is the supreme power who holds the whole universe in his hands die in blood and sweat and rags and tears? Why would God do that? There's no sense to this. 
And it's important to understand that when Paul talks about the foolishness of the preaching, he's not talking about the act of preaching. He's not saying that um, this preacher is making a fool of himself. He's talking about the content. It's the content of the preaching. It's the gospel that's foolish. It's the gospel that's weak. It, it does not give intellectual satisfaction until you come to know Christ yourself. It, it does not give um, kind of dynamic spiritual satisfaction until you've come to know Christ yourself. God is willing to show what he's done makes sense. And he's willing to show the power of the gospel. But he's not willing to do it in order to prove himself to anybody. Now the Greeks loved rhetoric and oratory, as to say they loved the ability to speak well, and they really were brilliant at it. Um, and they could they could speak for two or three hours, and they, they would do it without notes, and that would be coherent. Um, and they didn't even have the parenthesis, they didn't even have brackets, so they were able to kind of hold one thought in their mind, and then to move away from it, and then come back to it, and draw it back into another conclusion. It's a skill. It's a skill that they had learned. And Paul had set himself to have nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. Mm. And when he preached in, in Corinth, he wasn't using skillful words. This, this, this phrase here, um, there's that little phrase, when he speaks about the gospel and he says... It's the, I'm looking for this bit where he says that um, well I, I can see what an example of it in chapter 2 and verse 1 when he says and I brethren when I came to you did not come with excellence of speech but of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. I think that's a wonderful version of that, Paul. I mentioned this a little while ago in the church that sometimes if, if you kind of view a man through the gift that God has given him, um, you'll get a completely wrong idea of what the man is like. Uh, we usually meet Paul through his writings. Now, late in 2 Corinthians, Paul records a criticism that was made of him and people were saying about him that his writings, his letters are weak, are strong and powerful, they're heavy but he himself, his bodily presence is weak and his speech, that's to say his oratorical skills are contemptible now they didn't just meet him in his writings, they met him in person and in his preaching and in his person and in preaching he was not impressive he was not someone that you could say, well, yeah, I want to be on board this because these are this is the winners sort of thing. It was, <coughs> he really was, I've said this to you before, I think, that there's an old um, legend about Paul and what he looked like. And um, someone was sent to meet him who, had, who didn't know him at the quayside. And they were told to look for a small man, a Jew with a bald head and a large nose and eyebrows that met in the middle and bowed, uh, bowed down and not neat. Now, remember that the Greeks worshipped perfection. If you've ever seen Greek statues, there's no middle age spread ever in Greek statues. They never lose their hair. Everything is absolutely perfect. And God sent to these people who worshipped physical and mental perfection this little runt of a Jew with, with the gospel as a treasure hidden in an earthen vessel. Mm. And it's typically God. God does these kind of things. This is the way he works. So when God wanted to kind of reach the Jews, primarily he sent Peter. Now Peter came from Galilee of the Gentiles, which most Jews despised. To this, They didn't know whether they were Jews or Gentiles up there. They didn't know what they were. They didn't like the way they preached. They didn't think they got any leaning, learning of any kind. They were just they had no time for them. The Jews in Jerusalem often wouldn't even spend the time of day with people from up in Galilee. So God sends Peter to them. You see, God, he will not accommodate this pride in human nature. He will not do it. So he, he dresses everything up almost in order to cause a stumbling for people who want it to be another way. God will not do it this way. And this is what Paul is writing about. 
And, and, and this has a point in what Paul is saying, because these, these Greek people, they would have been proud in their ability to make their own minds up. Um, they wouldn't have been people who were natural followers. They invented democracy, remember? It didn't work for them either. Um, and what happens with democracy is that you, you, kind of, you give more and more rights to the individual until he's got absolute rights and no one else has got any rights in his life. And he's an island, ultimately. So you end up with this person who does exactly what he wants to do. Um, and you know that the Greeks really were never able to hold their empire together because the Greek city-states were always warring. Sparta wouldn't come to the health of Athens because they were independent. That's it, they're all independent cities. Let them, let them sort it out themselves. Now, this is, this is the attitude. This is the attitude of Greek culture which has come right through into our modern <coughs> culture. But it's also actually very human culture to kind of stand on our own feet and be convinced that we can sort this out, thing out ourselves. We've got the mental power to do this. We've got the strength to do this. We can do this thing. You, you know this phrase that people like to put in their CVs now? I, I am a can-do person. Now uh, that, that really oh would have kind of um, appealed. Have you done I mean, your CV, Mike? Not on mine. No. <laughs> well, you can change it now. Can I? <laughs> a a can-do person. Now the, the, the Greeks were really proud of being can-do persons can do people. They, they could do intellectually, they could do um, as regards that their strength, their natural strength, and God will, will not accommodate this at all. But he's determined when he writes to the Romans, he says that it's going to be by faith because it's to be of grace. This salvation is going to come as a free gift of God, and there will not be a corner that your self-effort can hide its head in. It will be absolutely clear to you that no kind of strength, mental, physical, spiritual, of any kind, made any contribution to your salvation. So this is it. But this is this is a revolutionary idea for the Greeks, and um, they're going to have to learn this. Okay. Um, let me show you in James the letter to James of James. And in chapter 3, <coughs> and he speaks about wisdom too in verse 13, but he's talking about really sort of Christian wisdom, spiritual wisdom. <coughs> really wisdom that comes from God. And this is the key thing about this other kind of wisdom. It, it doesn't rise up from a man's intellect. It doesn't it doesn't rise up because a man is able to think his way through. The wisdom, the real wisdom, is actually God's wisdom, and it comes from above. It's a gift. And, and this is what James says, chapter 3, and verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you, let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not... Uh, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom, so James is also talking about different kinds of wisdom, this wisdom does not descend from above. So there's two kinds of wisdom. There's one that descends from above, which is the gift of God, and there's another one which is or originates in earth and is earthbound. And then he says this, this wisdom does not <coughs> descend from above, but is, and then he puts three little adjectives together, it is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the <coughs> wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So there's another kind of wisdom that comes from God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he said, we do speak wisdom. We do speak wisdom, but not the wisdom of the world. And we do speak a, a wisdom to those who are mature, who are grown up in Christ. But it, it's not a rational thing. It's not, it's not that you're starting from the earth and working your way up to God. It actually begins with revelation. 
this, I think this is really what the fall was all about. That man could learn by revelation, by dependence upon the tree of life. Or he could learn by taking the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and that was, that was self-discovery, it was self-strength, it was self, what did you, you the phrase here, self-seeking, it was all, it, everything began in the self. And that was the step which took us on the course away from God. Okay. This wisdom, that was that little phrase there in James, Verse 15, this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual. Now, your, what does the King James Version say there? Sensual. It says sensual. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's interesting, because the next section we're going to come on to is these three different ways of speaking. And one of them is what is translated in the King James Version as natural. And it's this word here. You've got earthly. This word sensual is actually sukikos. Now, suke is soul. Um, and it, it really means soul-ish. I won't explain too much about that, because I'll leave that till the third section. But there's, there's a wisdom that is, it originates from the earth. It's, it's soulish, that's to say, it comes from man's animal instinct nature. And then he says it's demonic. So there's all these things that kind of park in it. It's, it's natural, it's earthbound, it's self-asserting, and actually it's fueled by an energy which is demonic. This is what James has to say. This is strong stuff. Okay, so what Paul wants to talk about is um, other things. He wants to talk about um, a different kind of a wisdom which has a different purpose and a different kind of impact. Oh, I know that verse I was looking for. It's actually 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 17. I've just seen it here in my notes. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 17. Yeah, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words. And then it's this little phrase at the end here. My King James Version, the New King James that I'm reading here, says, Lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Now the ESV and the RSV, I think it is, which is actually almost the same book, um, they use a phrase here which is very interesting. It, it translates something like this. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be emptied of its power. In Philippians chapter 2, when it speaks of Jesus making himself of no reputation, it says he emptied himself. It's a, it's a, it's a word which means something which is empty. And it's the same word here. Now, this is a verse that kind of ought always to haunt preachers and teachers. And anyone. It, it ought to, they ought to come back to this verse again and again and again. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be emptied of its power. Mm -hmm. Apparently it's possible for eloquence, intellectual skill, natural brilliance to be so effective that it actually saps the gospel of its spiritual power. Now that is frightening. Mm -hmm. But it's very, very possible. It's very pos possible to become such a skilled speaker, such a skilled uh, preacher, that you're able to do things, and it's it's almost like listening to a piece of music, because some people can do this so well. It's a beautiful kind of a thing. Um, and apparently, it can actually empty people. That doesn't mean we've got to kind of be crude, and it doesn't mean we've got to kind of fracture our English as even more than we do. It's just simply saying that if you build in this kind of finery, this eloquence, this high soaring stuff, this wisdom of the world, if you put all that in it, what you, the only way you can make room for that actually is by emptying it of its own power. There's only so much room in the gospel and it's either full of God's power or it's full of other things that you put into it. 
It's, um, it's a very, very powerful statement and a, a real warning to us always. <coughs> um, okay, let me just show you um, where Paul speaks about uh, the rulers of this age. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7, <coughs> He says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. And then he says this in verse 8, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. This is an amazing statement. Mm -hmm. Now, who are these rulers of this age? Does it mean people like Pilate and Caiaphas and Caesar? Well, I think it does, but I think it means more than that as well, because if you go to um, Ephesians, um, if I can find this for the verse, Ephesians 2 and verse 2, Ephesians 2 and verse 2 says this. He's talking about them being dead in trespasses and sins in which you once <coughs> walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. And that word prince is the ruler. The spirit who is now working in the sons of disobedience. The ruler, the ruler of this age is the spirit of disobedience. That's to say, it's Satan himself. And you've got a statement here in 1 Corinthians where Paul is saying, and it's, an, it's another one of these really striking statements. He says, if they had known what was happening at the cross, they wouldn't have allowed it to happen. Yeah. There are things that the Satan doesn't know, you see. Um, he doesn't understand the significance of things because there are some things that are only spiritually revealed and God only reveals them by his spirit to people who he has prepared to receive these things that doesn't mean that Satan doesn't understand the theology I'm sure he understands the theology it doesn't mean he, 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 didn't, he doesn't understand some of the implications but he, he did not understand that this supreme act of defiance and rebellion in which he provoked the human race to become a God murderer actually was God's means of salvation. That the cross, not, mm. not the crown and the scepter, not the sword and the white warrior horse, but this king who comes to you meek and lowly and riding on an ass's coat, this, this one, this one who is prepared to die in weakness, this is the power of God. This is deep, deep mystery and it's something which to this day of course is is something that is completely unintelligible to the world there's a there's a, a phrase in the world that they they use it quite often they'll talk about like lambs to the slaughter and and what they mean is these people won't stand up to them for themselves it, when they say that this is sheep like um, that they 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 never describe them as being like a sheep in order to commend them. They always do it to kind of to say something bad about them. It's like, um, isn't it someone who said of uh, Jeffrey Howe that it was like being worried to death by a dead sheep or something like that? Savage. Savage. Savage by a dead sheep. Yes. Um, but it's, it's, it's this idea because the sheep is despised. It's got virtually no means of defense. Uh, if you think of a shepherd around, it's just utterly vulnerable. Um, and this method that God had chosen of sending his son to be the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world is unintelligible to this mindset. It is unintelligible to this mindset. It doesn't mean that they don't know the facts. It just, it just will not compute. It does not make sense to this mindset. It does not make sense to the power merchant of this world, the people who kind of control the currencies and the people who control the governments. This concept that God in abject weakness would do something which would break the power of hell, it, 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 they cannot get their head around that.
It's just, it's unknown to them. And, but it, it isn't intended to be unknown to us. But what had happened to the Corinthians was that they had, they either had not seen or they'd forgotten that this is the way God always does those things. Not by staging acts of kind of supreme strength, but by surrendering and by laying down his life. Okay, we'll have a pause.